there's a bitter new reality for people with AIDS. While there are now more drugs to prolong their lives, when the time comes, their deaths are more excruciating. No one knows this reality better than the nurses of Ward 5A at San Francisco General Hospital. Seven years ago, the hospital commissioned a nurse to create this first ever ward just for AIDS patients. It's been the nation's model ever since. It's not an easy place to visit, either for us who went there or for you who were asking to watch it. I say bless his heart and I hope he's having a good time because I know he's not suffering anymore. Just three months on the job, and this was the fifth time Alice Downing had tagged and wrapped a human being. This time it was a 43-year-old man, a man Alice had bathed, hugged, and called her friend. I'll call the morgue. The nurse's job continues here. You gotta take care of one person and go on to the next person and try to have your self composed. I'll take you down where the action is. It may not mean much on other wards, but here, even a bath is a big deal. Alice still remembers the time she bathed a very ill AIDS patient, and he turned to her dripping wet and thanked her for making him feel like a million bucks. What Alice does is give patients a part of herself. It's not something she learned in nursing school. She wasn't supposed to become a friend to her patients. Well, she, she could walk by and goes like, morning, Tom. Yeah, that, yeah, that feels good. Alice says she feels the pain of people AIDS turns into pariahs. Tom's wife left him when she found out he had AIDS. Doctors and nurses poked at him from behind protective masks and gloves. And then he wound up on Ward 5A with Alice. And she comes in and grabs my hand. I, like I said, I had no human contact for a year and didn't touch anybody. What do you mean? You know, like, just, just somebody touching your hand. What does it do to a person, Tom, to not be touched for a year? It really uh, puts you out of the picture. I mean, you uh, forget love, you forget things like that. It's, uh, when somebody does touch you, you go, wow. You're not used to it and you really enjoy it. The risk of getting close to people, Alice says, is knowing that you're going to lose them. The loss here is constant. Alice has just been told that another person she took care of has died. Thank you for telling me. Alice's nursing school professors warned her this would happen if she got too involved. Do you think there's a professor in, in a nursing school somewhere that would be wagging his or her finger at you saying, you're not doing things the way we taught you, Alice? I think that would be great. <laughs> um, and I would look at them straight in the eyes and say, and you're not here right now. <laughs> you know, you're not in my shoes. You're not a danger to them. Down the hall, nurse Kathy O'Leary has returned after a leave of absence. Last year, when she suddenly lost a lot of weight, she panicked. She knew another nurse at the hospital had contracted the virus from a needle stick. Even though she tested negative for AIDS, Kathy left the ward for six months. Give us a call. Take it easy. You look good. What brought her back was what she says she missed, the best nursing of her 17-year career. Take care of yourself. But did the fear go away? I still have moments at home that I go, oh, God, have I gotten the virus? Even though I logically know I haven't. Maybe I, there's still that fear that comes up. Um, I'm very respectful of this virus. You have a temperature again, too. And when I'm sick, I want someone to be there and essentially tell me it's going to be okay. I know they can't take it away, but tell me they're there. Tell me I'm not alone. And, and that's what you do, is you be there for them. It sounds simple, but Dorothy is testing Kathy's principles. Even though she wants everything possible done to keep her alive, round-the-clock medicines are wearing her down. How about finishing this one this much for me? Look, die drinking this shit. I don't blame you. This, as we said, is the bitter new reality of AIDS. There are more drugs around to prolong patients' lives, but their deaths are more excruciating than ever. Hi. By the next morning, Dorothy has been put in restraints, 
so she won't pull out her intravenous tubes. I'm the nurse. I'm taking care of you. You're in the hospital, sweetie. She no longer recognizes Kathy, who can only guess at what she wants. Ah! Oh, hey. I was trying to wipe off the face. Now it takes two nurses to move Dorothy. She begins to spasm in pain, making it harder for them to avoid contact with her blood and bodily fluids, the two places where the AIDS virus lives. She is crumbling in their hands. It's pathetic that someone gets to that point. They have no control, and it's, it's, it's so sad that the body gets to that. Okay. 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 Wasn't it a lot easier, Kathy, for you as a nurse, when there were fewer medications to take care of some of these infections and when AIDS took people quickly instead of these long, lingering, terribly painful deaths? Maybe it's easier from my point of view, because I, I hate to see the suffering. Now it's just a waiting game. Nurses must continue treating Dorothy until her family says no more. What can you do for Dorothy now? Um, I can give her pain medicine and I can keep her very comfortable. I can decrease some of her agitation and tell her it's where she is and it's okay and um, that she's safe and we're taking care of her. Do you ever wish you could walk by this room and not have to go in? I'm here because I want to be. And that's part of it. And if I get to a point that I don't want to walk into a room, then I need to go somewhere else. In a matter of hours, Dorothy's family will stop treatment. Kathy will then give her enough morphine to stay peaceful. Do your patients ever talk to you about taking their own lives? Some patients have asked me just to give them something to end it, to make them go to sleep. And what have you done? I said I can't do that. Can you understand a nurse who might? Very definitely. It hurts to see someone in pain. And it hurts to stand there and they're looking at you. And they want relief. I can't do that. And they know you can't. But they're pleading. What is your experience with people with AIDS? Minimal. Random. Nurses line up to work on Ward 5A, and the staff has a vote on who joins their ranks. When they interview, they don't sugarcoat what it's like to work with AIDS patients. But a lot of it still is diarrhea and vomit and, you know, just a lot of it. A lot of dirty nursing care. They look for nurses who can live up to their motto. We deal with everything from diarrhea to dementia, and still have fun. The nurses here are gay and straight, and they come from all walks of life, just like their patients. On this ward, everyone is accepted for who he or she is. It was Kitty Parker, the nurse with the purple hair and wildest earrings, who I found late one night, kneeling beside Rudy's bed, quietly talking to him about dying with dignity. Five times before she had managed to patch him up and send him home, but not this time. This time his immune system is ruined. Kitty tells Rudy he must think about going to hospice. You know, little death houses. It's not like that, Rudy. Well, everybody in there has got their time ticking away their little hourglass. What alternative do you see for yourself right now? What's important to Kitty is that Rudy knows to get his life in order. She doesn't hold back the truth. She's his friend, and that softens the impact. I just have to be clever enough. <laughs> yeah, but we're running out of magic wands. Something will happen. You know, it's just kind of like time to run away from home and join the circus and start all over again. You know, the other night I thought that we had lost the you that were you, but it's still there. In room after room, there are nurses whose roles go way beyond implementing doctor's orders. Oh, 
Are you yelling? Because oh, you're happy to see me, sir. Anne McCabe had never met a transsexual before she started working on the ward a year ago. That's good. <laughs> calm down. Calm, calm, calm. Angels calm. cry, hold my hand, don't leave me alone. His family is nowhere in sight. Take it easy. Okay, but, uh, a lot of people are in uh, deep problems with their families. And I don't have any children. And this work is so intimate. I've, uh, I've never really thought of myself as a parent, but I do hear and I find myself occasionally calling patients son. And I've never done that anywhere. But I can't help it. I, I feel like a mother. It's worth it. Worth it to say son to somebody and then watch them die? Yes. Oh, honey, what am I going to do with you? A deadly pneumonia drains Angel's physical strength. His spirit is already broken. He made me feel like you know John. Like what? Like I'm nobody. His words, people make me feel like I'm nobody. What do you want to give his patients? I want them to know that their life was meaningful and that I care and that people do care that they're sick. Do you think that a lot of them feel their life isn't meaningful? I think a lot of people feel shame with this illness, have a lot of guilt. Do they talk to you about that? Sometimes. Sometimes they just cry. Oh. Oh. And sometimes it just gets to be too much, and the suffering spills over into anger. Well, you know what I did? He was just banging on the door when I was in there. You're right. And I know I'm not right. anymore. Thank you. David Denmark sees AIDS as war, and he's a combat nurse, tough as nails. Okay. Stop shouting. I have to have somebody else to call me. Okay. The reason why I'm shouting is I'm very upset. I haven't had any sleep in a long time, and he's part of the reason. He may be part of the reason, but he is very, very ill also. I know he is. Okay. I even looked at him. So you take responsibility for your actions, and we'll try and keep him quiet. You're welcome. He was banging on the wall of a dying patient next door because the dying patient was making too much noise. Did a part of you want to bang on that wall yourself? Oh, of course. I understand what he's feeling, but it's not something we can allow. Um, that other person has the right to go through whatever they're going through with a sense of calm and dignity, too. David came to the ward for just a year. That was five years ago. What's kept him here is a fantasy, a fantasy that he will be on the ward to celebrate when a cure is announced. But David says he's tired of waiting for that cure and angry that he's losing hope. I'm cynical at this point about the disease itself. But does that make the nursing harder? Oh, the sure. Cynicism? Because it gives you that hopeless feeling once again, and you feel powerless. Um, now he is talking about leaving because he's lost so many friends to this virus. He's lost so much of himself. A friend of mine died on the unit. I took care of him, wrapped his body, and sent it to the morgue. And what since did that, that time, you? since I did this for Ken, I have not been able to cry. Everybody who's come On our last day here, David showed me Ward 5A's memorial, a dog-eared book that lists every patient who has died. There are more than 1,200 names. The nurses here have a saying, don't regret growing old. It's a privilege denied to many. A privilege Tom, Dorothy, Angel, and Rudy will never know. Their names are now written in that book. When you look at this, you're kind of overwhelmed because you, the faces come back. You want to close the book? Yeah. The quilt continues to grow.